I am Rucha and will be presenting on processing elements of E04 data right from acquisition planning to data dissemination. Broadly, I will speak about the E04 mission in brief, data processing in a gist with planning for future acquisition, the ground station workflow, data dissemination, and near real-time visualization. The E04 mission is a follow-on mission of RISAT-1 with C-band SAR having the capability to image and strip map, scan SAR, and spotlight modes. SAR is an active sensor with its own source of energy and with its capabilities of dawn to dusk imaging in all weather conditions. It caters to diverse applications from agriculture to disaster management support, especially during floods and cyclones. The multi-mission ground segment is designed to support the data reception, or, uh, processing, and dissemination of E04 date, SAR data on ground. The satellite is programmed to acquire the user-demanded data and systematic acquisition of Indian coverage. The acquisition schedules are received as an input from planner to the workflow manager for automatic scheduling of acquisition and pre-processing of the data at ground stations. The acquired data is processed to generate the predefined products. Post quality check, these products are archived and further cataloged for online dissemination. Bunidi Planner is a web application for submitting requests for fresh acquisitions. Any user can specify the area of interest and requested dates and can then view the possibility of acquisition. The submission of the planning request is only by registered and authorized users. The requests submitted are honored as per the feasibility and post acquisition, the user may see the acquired data over this area of interest and add to cart. The future tasking can be done for various applications like disaster monitoring, ground truth collection, the global air AY coverage, international ground stations, and cat catering to charter emergency requests. The next element in the ground station workflow is the station workflow manager. The station workflow manager is the centralized element to manage automation of operational tasks at the ground station from data reception to pre-processing of data in multi-mission environment for all in-orbit satellites. Driven by the acquisition schedule, it handles E04 mission specific processing chains and integrates data received from multiple ground stations. The next element being the data, data products workflow manager. It's a workflow automation software that controls and provides the information base to manage the entire data product generation chain. With its inbuilt priority handlers and load balancer, it ensures optimal turnaround time and utilization of resources. The monitoring for both these workflows is done by the enterprise event monitor and control in the ground station multi-mission environment. It provides visualization of product workflow status and facilitates corrective action in case of automatic process failures. Once the products are generated, they are made available at Bhuniti, the data dissemination application. Bhuniti hosts a repository of Earth observation remote sensing data from various satellites right from 1988 to fresh acquisitions being added on a daily basis. It is also the regional distribution hub of Sentinel and Landsat 8 and 9 data in India, providing faster access of these data sets for Indian users. E04 SAR data hosted at Bhunidhi includes the level 2B ARD products, the georeference products, and soon to be released the soil moisture products over Indian landmass. This shows the different type of satellites, both open and commercial, for which we have data in our archives. Bhunidhi features various user-friendly search options to ease target area identification, even based input specifications, map draw tools, and data hosting over cloud with online processing capabilities. The various data dissemination modes 
include HTTPS based data downloads for open data, along with batch downloader tool for price data. Disseminated uh, data dissemination is via media or FTP. The, uh, the data ordering flow initiates with the selection of area of interest in the form of a location, polygon, or a shape file. This is followed by selection of the date range and filters by resolution, imaging spectrum, or sensor type. Once the satellite sensor is selected, data is fetched and made available for user selection. User selected data is added to cart for open data, like now MRS and CRS data. The cart may be confirmed and data can be downloaded instantly. For price data, the cart can be converted to a performer invoice. This performer invoice can be subsequently converted to order and the order status can be monitored while the products are being generated. Apart from data being available for direct download, e data is also made available to be visualized at full resolution at Bhunidhi Vista. This application showcases how India looked in the recent past by Indian and other Earth observation sensors. Here we see the full India coverage by e 4 SAR MRS data. The analysis tools available at Vista include comparison slider that allows for comparison of various satellite imagery facilitating change detection. The linear management tools aids the elementary analysis of distance and the feature area estimation is useful for disaster impact analysis. Here we see the FRS-1 polarimetric decomposed imagery of Brahmaputra floods. Next is the near real-time flood mapping of Assam floods in June 2023 with E04 data displaying the sigma naught product and the flood layer. The next visual is of Sikkim flood in October 2023 where we see the pre- and post-processing scenarios of the South Lona Lake outburst. This imagery is of Chennai Airport acquired on 10th July 2022 in fine resolution strip map mode. Bhunidhi also hosts a huge repository where the user can, help, uh, can find help documents and videos, sample products, tools, and workshop material for ready access. Shortly, we will be releasing API-based data access for machine-to-machine -machine data and online compute environment for E04 data at Bhunidhi. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Parasuram from National Institute of Technology, Karnataka, Suratkal. I work on hyperspectral data analysis and relative spectral discrimination power is a measurement used to analyze hyperspectral data. Today I am going to present my work on relative spectral discrimination power. Abstract. Spectral matching algorithms used to correlate and discriminate different spectral signatures are developed based on different theoretical strategies. Evaluating the performance of different SMEs in discriminating various spectral signatures is a challenging task. Relative spectral discrimination power is one such a measure used to evaluate the performance of various SMEs in dis distinguishing various target spectral signatures. This work, present, this work presents a reformulation for classical way of measuring relative spectral discrimination power. Overview of this presentation includes related work, proposed work, and data used for experimentation. Then results are discussed and conclusions are presented, followed by references at the end of the presentation. Spectral matching algorithms. SAM, SEM, SID, PC, GSSM are few SMAs developed in the literature. Spectral discriminatory probability, spectral discriminatory entropy, and relative spectral discrimination power are few spectral discriminability measures proposed or available in the literature. This work focuses on relative spectral discriminatory power. Relative spectral discriminatory power discriminates how one target spectral signature is different from another target signature 
relative to a reference spectral signature. Equation 1 presents how classical way of relative spectral discrimination power is measured. Relative spectral discrimination power is measured as a simple ratio between similarity or correlation values of target spectral signatures with respect to the reference spectral signatures. The similarity or correlation between the two target spectral signatures to be discriminated are not considered in this. That is what makes classical way of RSDPW measurement not so robust. Therefore, a meaningful way of uh, re measuring RSDPW is considered by incorporating uh, similarity between two target spectral signatures to be discriminated and reformulation is shown as in the equation number 2. Reformulated RSDPW looks at the target and reference spectral signatures simultaneously and this is what helps to find how far target spectral signatures are from each other and from the reference spectral signature. The figure shown in the left side presents how classical way of RSDPW is insensitive to positive or negative correlation since it is a simple ratio. And the figure presented in the right side shows how incorporating spectral correlation between target signatures are useful in measuring spectral discrimination power in a more meaningful manner. RSDP values are considered to be reformulated RSDP values are considered to be to varies from 0 to 1 and 1 represent complete discrimination and 0 represents no discrimination. A spectral library of 5 minerals is formed from the cuprates uh, data as mentioned in the reference 11. So, n members are extracted for all those 5 minerals using the PPI technique and shown here. And two cases are considered for uh, evaluating performance of uh, former RSDPW and reformulated RSDPW. First case considers alunite as a reference spectral signature and second case considers desert varnish as a reference spectral signatures. And the remaining other combination of two spectral signatures are considered as a target signatures. And former RSDPW varies from 1 to infinity and Lower values around 1 are considered to be lower discrimination power and higher va values higher than 10 are considered to be good discrimination. The table presented at the left side clearly shows former RSDPW for ED and SID are poor. But whereas RSDPW showed, shown by SAM are reasonably good. And RSDPW values proposed obtained for from the re, uh, reformulation are uh, for ED and SID are reasonably good. And as SAM showed higher discrimination in case of dissimilar targets and lower discrimination in case of similar targets. Visual inspection of reformulated RSPW who supports PPI N members present uh, visual inspection of PPI N members uh, and their discriminability. This table present different levels of discrimination power starting from no discrimination to complete discrimination including poor marginal good and high discrimination. The range of RSDPV values for different levels of discrimination is easy for proposed of RSTPW since it varies from 0 to 1 whereas for former 
आर एस टी पी डब्ल्यू इट इज डिफिकल्ट टू अबटेन द वेरिए रेंजस् आफ आर एस टी पी वैल्यूस एस्पेली वेन इट कम्स टू द टारगेट सिग्नेचर्स विच हेव रेफर विच हेव लोयर सिमिलारटी वैल्यूस आर् वेरी इनसेटिव अंड नाट हेव मोर मीनिंगफु वे आफ डिस्क्रिमेशन पवर ओवर आल द रिजल्ट शो दट द रीफार्मुलेटेड आर एस टी पी इज नाट ओनली ए मीनिंगफु वे टू मेजर इट बट आलो ए रीजनबली गुड चाईस एनफ टू कंपेर वेरियस एस एम एस अमांग आल एस एम एस सैम इज शोड बेटर डिस्क्रिमेशन पवर बोथ विद द फार्मर अंड रीफार्मुलेटेड आर एस टी पी डब्ल्यू दि रेंजस् आफ आर एस टी पी वैल्यूस फर् डिफरेंट लेवल्स आफ डिस्क्रिमेशन इज ईजी फर् प्रपोज वन दीज आर सम आफ द रेफरस used for this study thank you everyone i am swati and today i'll be presenting synchronous quizzing transform based if estimation for target detection improvement in sfcw radars step frequency continuous wave signals or popularly known as sfcw signals are used in ground penetration radars uh the major advantage is being it reduces the hardware complexities and improves the performance of the system the traditional data processing methods such as inverse fourier transform uh, are used to derive the range profiles from the acquired frequency domain data but that causes weaker targets contamination by noise and side lobes of the stronger targets advanced techniques such as those based on ic and pc have been used for improving the radar performance via processing but they they don't work on 1d data or the a scan data uh, for of synchro squeezing transform and frequency range detection based instantaneous if estimation method is being proposed for denoising and improved target detection capabilities in step frequency radar sscw transmit signal consists of multiple frequencies within a frequency band um, being transmitted in steps of delta f and uh, with a dwell time of td uh, the total sweep time uh, covered by them is ts and the entire signal that we receive in the ts duration is used to reconstruct the sig- uh, received signal to uh, synthesize a high pro- uh, high uh, resolution uh, profile and the received signal contains the iq signals containing both the amplitude and the phase information of targets at each transmit frequency for the processing using idft to derive target range and electrical characteristics by synthesizing a narrow pulse in time domain there is a one to one correspondence between the frequency of the synthesized received signal and the target distance which is better used which is used to better estimate the frequency components of the signal and can very accurately recreate target profiles and remove unwanted noise from the signal Signal processing algorithms capable of accurate IF estimation can thus reconstruct GPR target profiles and improve dynamic range achieved by signal denoising. So, in search of a better frequency estimation algorithm, we have tried using Fourier synchro squeezing transform, which is built upon short time Fourier transform. It generates sharper time frequency estimates than SGFT transform. the frequency fsst determines the stft of a function f using a spectral window and the transform values are squeezed to concentrate energy around the if curves in tf plane if is estimated from fsst output by extracting ridges using the ridge detection algorithm using inverse fsst tf correspondence of transform data is used to reconstruct signal desired targets and denoise them by ignoring the ridges representing noise or unwanted targets during the inverse transform synchro squeezing transform produces narrow ridges compared to that derived from the stft output resulting in better target detection and noise or unwanted target suppression coming to the algorithm received complex signal the iq data for one frequency sweep is for um, firstly for your synchro squeeze transform the transform domain data is then uh, used for frequency ridge detection the received signal recreation is next done using the frequency ridges and inverse 
frequency synchro squeezing TF transform is then applied. The IDFT of the denoise signal is then used to get the denoise range profiles. The simulations and the validation methodology is as follows. Simulated received IQ data is generated for radar with frequency step from 250 MHz to 750 MHz in steps of 5 MHz, which means a radar of 500 MHz bandwidth. Three targets simulated at ranges R1 equal to 5 meter, 10 meter, and 20 meter is simulated. The algorithm is tested for different SNR scenarios ranging from 10 dB to minus 5 dB by adding Gaussian noise to received IQ signal. Performance of the weak target was also simulated for 0 dB SNR to show the suitability of algorithm for improving detectability of weak targets, otherwise not detectable using the conventional IDFT approach. Applicability of this approach tested for removing unwanted targets such as coupling and ground return to clearly see the weaker targets. The results in each case are compared with those achieved using the conventional processing approach to show the improvements achieved. Method is also validated on the actual field acquired radar data of same frequency band. Coming to the simulation results, here you can see four graphs corresponding to a no noise case SNR equal to 10 dB, SNR equal to minus 5 dB, and SNR equal to minus 10 dB. Each of the scenario consists of four graphs showing the real part of the received uh, signal at different transmit frequencies, that is, the I signal the Fourier synchro squeeze transform signal, the synchro squeeze transform ridge, sig ridge detection signal and the denoise signal that is the detected signal after the inverse Fourier synchro squeeze transform in the last um, plot. The, the two over plots shown in the last plot are that for the proposed processing shown in blue and the conventional processing shown in uh, red color. So as you can see in the ideal case, when the, both the techniques, the results are matching. While as we start in, um, degrading the SNR, we see that the noise starts dominating in the propo uh, conventional processing technique while it gets suppressed in the proposed processing. Uh, for the SNR equal for up to SNR uh, minus 5 dB, we can see that we are still able to reconstruct all the three targets that we had simulated, that is the ones that 5 meter, 10 meter as well as 20 meter. But as we start degrading the SNR to minus 10 dB, we see that some of the targets start getting missed like the target at 10 meter got missed in the proposed technique. So we can safely say that we can use this technique for SNRs up to minus 5 dB very well. Next we uh, uh, tested this technique for weak targets in noisy data. So here we used a uh, SNR of 1 that is 0 dB and see that the, there is significant difference in the target profile at 20 meter. Uh, while the target at 20 meter is um, barely visible due to the excess noise in the conventional processing technique that is in the red color, it is clearly detectable due to the suppressed noise in the proposed technique. Also, we have uh, tested this technique to remove the unwanted targets at 10 meter and 5 meter, where we can see that we are very easily uh, able to remove the targets at 5 meter, 10 meter, and the target at 20 meter rem remains as it is, and the signal to noise ratio has significantly improved in this scenario. For experimental validation, we have used field data of an in-house developed GPR instrument at ISRO and at working at the similar frequencies. Uh, we could see that there is significant improvement observed in both A scan as well as 2D B scan image. Here we can see the A scan performance for um, the proposed and the conventional algorithm while the same um, while in the next two graphs we see the B scan image with IFFT based processing and the B scan image with the proposed algorithm. Uh, here we can see that the proposed method regenerates range profiles from noisy frequency domain data keeping target amplitudes and phase unaffected. There is significant reduction even for received signal to noise ratio as low as minus 5 dB improves the target detection.
This also effectively cancels out the effect of unwanted returns such as antenna coupling and surface returns. Coming to the summary and the conclusion. The study investigated use of four synchro squeeze transform based detection for radar target detection. It is tested both on simulated as well as SFCW GPR data acquired over realistic scenarios. The results indicate that the proposed approach indeed suppresses noise and target detects targets accurately even for multi-target scenarios. The produced results are much better than those using existing IDFT based methods. Future work may target improving the speed of the algorithm for implementation in real-time processing of SFCW GPR data. These are the select references used in our study. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can you hear? Yeah, I'm able to hear you. Am I audible? Uh, you can ask. Hello? What's the resolution of this one? Is, it, is it your method affect resolution? A special resolution? Of... Hello? Huh? Hello? Swati ji? Hello? Yeah, uh, your volume is a bit feeble. Could you be a bit louder? Okay. So, uh, this, this method what you are using, is it any yeah. effect on uh, a special resolution of your, no, a special resolution. Of yeah, uh, the resolution actually is dependent on uh, the window length that we're using for the Fourier synchro squeezing. So the Gaussian window that we are using, uh, the uh, standard deviation of that Gaussian window will decide the resolution for this one. So if you want to detect a narrower one, the Gaussian window has to be shaped accordingly. Oh. The Gaussian window length as well as the alpha. Part of it. So there is trade off between more better noise. Uh, you know, you want to handle how good, well noise and uh, how closely you want to separate two targets. Is there in trade off? Just, just wanted to know. So, is there any trade off <laughs> between you know how the how well this method is handling noise and or, and the distance between two target. So we have tested it for uh, SNR scenarios almost up to minus five, minus ten dB. Minus five, uh, it's working quite good. Uh, like for weaker targets, it might uh, get a bit uh, um, falter somewhere. But for minus five, we have seen that it's working quite well compared to the IDFT that is um, presently being used. Uh, for minus ten onwards, it will start missing targets. So, um, but the generally what we see, what the general scenario is, we work up to scenarios of uh, plus 5 dB uh, SNR and 0 dB. The worst case is zero. Uh, generally, we try to keep an SNR of plus 5 for which uh, this one would work quite well. Okay. Right, so. Can you, I am a lay person in this area. Can you explain that synchro squeezing transformation? Uh, synchro squeezing transform is uh, a modified depth. form of. Hello, am I audible? You are audible. In very simple terms, can you explain me? Because I'm completely novice in this uh, particular field. Okay. Uh, in frequency, uh, uh, this Fourier synchro squeezing transform, what we do is uh, we uh, you, uh, see the data in time frequency domain. And then uh, once we have the time frequency domain data, we reassign the spectrum, like uh, the, the spectrum lines that we see in the time frequency domain, it would be further squeezed. So the resolution uh, improves uh, of the uh, individual modes that we are seeing in the signal. So since the um, SFC sub CW received signal is made of multiple frequency components, okay, each okay. of the frequency it's components it represents a okay, okay, target okay. in yeah. a time domain. Yeah, you know, the other yes, thing, uh, the GPR, it is ground, ground penetrating radar, right? Yes, sir. So do we have any data like, you know, studying the uh, bottom topography? of lakes and uh... Uh, 
this gpr was used in antarctica and uh, we had used it to study the topography for um, ice layers in antarctica this particular gpr so uh, for ssw areas you know we don't have in india hmm? about gpr uh, based data but what topography one uh, this one was used in antarctica actually this was more of made for uh, this uh, ice studies and also yeah. so you also mentioned about uh, extraction of ridges and ridge detection but i yes, feel sir. that these are not the terrestrial ridges right they are the ridges in the signals that you are talking right yeah ridges in the signal the uh, tf uh, um, domain data that we are seeing the ridges in that represent the individual frequency modes that we have detected so okay. ridges are the frequency ridges okay thank you thank you shwati yeah Bye. thank you sir hello everyone our study title is analysis of shadow interference of chromatic information in unmanned aerial vehicle optical imagery Unmanned, vehicle, unmanned aerial vehicles have tremendously developed and contributed to domains taking advantage of the affordable and fast source of gathering data. In optical remote sensing technology, a prominent issue which is faced by passive sensors is the presence of shadow in the optical imagery. Shadow occurs when objects are occluded from light source due to another object or the angle of inclination of the light source. Shadows are the critical regions that affect the quality of information in optical imagery. In addition, shadow enhancement in the pre-processing step is now missing in the most widely used softwares. As a result, in innovating an approach to eliminate shadow is necessary and required during photogrammetric calculation from close-range optical sensing. The possibility to demarcate the shadow regions using the pixel value of UAV's images should be tested. Moving to the experimental data. An experimental setup was made using a cupidal box on which different color strips were placed. So shadows were also formed on some parts of the color strips. We can see in the figure one the experimental setup of a calibration pad. Also color strips were made of five colors, red, green, blue, black, and white. An image was acquired using a UAV optical sensor, which is further used for research analysis. Moving to our methodology, the image acquired through UAV optical sensor was split into three corresponding red, green, and blue bands. A few points were selected in the shadow and non-shadow regions of each color strip in each of the three bands. The digital number values obtained at these points were plotted for further observations and analysis to understand the contribution of shadows at the pixel levels. Our study, we have done our study in two cases. The first case, analysis based on different bands. In this case, the analysis is done based based on uh, each band individually. The overall observations describe that in the red band, it, it is observed that uh, the shadow and non-shadow regions are quite distinguishable for red, blue, black, and white strips, and not for green strip. The observation in the green band showed that the shadow and non-shadow regions are quite distinguishable in the in all in all <laughs> of the color strips the observation in the blue band showed that the shadow and non-shadow regions are quite distinguishable in the blue and white strips only we can see in figure three uh, the digital value the digital number values obtained for uh, the pixels in the shadow and non-shadow regions over different color strips in different bands. The second case in our study was based on different color strips. In this case, each color strip is analyzed, analyzed in each band individually. 
The observations for red strip showed that shadows could be distinguished in red, in red and green bands only. In green strip, the analysis showed that the shadow sh could be dis distinguished only in green band. The observations for blue strip showed that shadows could be distinguished in all three bands. In blue strip, the observation indi indicated that shadows could be distinguished in red, green, and green bands. The observation for white strip showed that shadows could be distinguished in all three bands. We can see here in the figure four, uh, the digital number values obtained for the pixels in the shadow and non-shadow regions over different bands. Moving ahead to our conclusion, this complementary information obtained from each color strips and from each band can be used in some mathematical compute computential form to optimize uh, the shadow pixel values. A relationship can be tried to establish to overcome the chromatic interference of pixel values due to the presence of shadow and can be tried to enhance the information. Further, a pre-processing step can be included in the photogrammetric software so that the final results can be improved. This technique can be applicable for further enhancement of the shadow region of UAV optical images in order to extract the shadow area. Thank you so much. Good afternoon to everyone present here. Myself, Akilesh, and joining by me is Nigel. We are from Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. We are here to present our paper, Microwave NDT for Estimating Organic Textile Dye Residue on Topsoil. The main objective of the paper is to detect the soil pollutant, especially from the textile industry. As we all know, textile dyes can have adverse effects on soil quality, with major factors of soil pollutant being wastewater and waste dyes from the textile sectors. These textile units release untreated or inadequately treated effluents containing high concentration of dye compounds into water bodies. These eventually seep into the soil. Dye usually contains heavy metals or toxic chemicals that persist in the soil for a longer duration, causing degradation to the soil quality, making it uh, unfit for cultivation. Various existing solutions like offline laser-based technique, bio-nano sensor and other invasive techniques have already been developed and reported. This paper provides a sustainable solution using microwave reflectometry, a non-destructive estimation technique. With this technique, the soil contamination can be detected and bioremediation measures can be carried out to improve the soil quality. Coming to the dye contaminants used in the experiment, the dyes were classified using IR spectroscopy with attenuated total reflectance mode. The identification of the functional group present in the soil were obtained from the wave number observed from the transmission spectral plot, spectra plot. This is shown, the plots are shown in slide 4. The black dye A exhibits alcohol group, the purple dye figure B exhibits an alkene group and brown dye has an ether as the prominent functional group. Interestingly, all three groups show the presence of OH group. For the experiment, all the three dyes are mixed together using a sonicator and transformed into a single composite powder, which is then used in the dye as a dye contaminant on the topsoil. These are the transmission spectra plots. So for a black dye, the wave number is around 1100 and for a purple dye, the wave number is around 1200 and for a brown dye, the wave number is between 1200 to 1300. Before moving into the experimental setup, the contamination of the soil is studied by observing the reflection characteristics. The reflector, reflection characteristic is usually a function of various factors. Here, 
the composition of the organic dye influences the properties and the ability of, to observe the reflected electromagnetic waves. Second, the concentration of the dye added to the soil surface also plays an important role in influencing the reflection characteristics. Higher the concentration of the dye molecules, the higher the interaction with the soil particles and the electromagnetic waves. The frequency range of the reflection measurements carried out also serves as an important function. And finally, the depth of dispersion of the contaminant dye into the soil will also affect the reflection characteristics. So based on the various factors, the reflection characteristic plots provide us the details on how much the soil is contaminated. Moving to the experimental setup and the procedure, the experimental setup was as follows. The experiment was carried out at the microwave laboratory at Amrita Vishwavidya Pira. The soil was filled in a box with dimension of 47 cm length and 21 cm width and 28 cm height and the soil was filled up to a depth of 20 cm. The textile dye were mixed at a surface of soil considering a mixing depth of 5 cm. The contamination dye was added starting with 50 grams with an increase of 50 grams at fixed interval until reaching 500 grams. In the end, 100 grams was added to amount to a total of 600 grams of dye. With addition of dyes every interval, readings were carried out using a vector network analyzer. The readings were performed between the frequency range of 8.2 GHz and 12.4 GHz, which is often considered as the X-band frequency. So the obtained results are as follows. Prior, prior to detecting contamination, as a golden reference, a plot of reflectivity versus frequency is obtained for heterogeneous soil mixture. This serves as the baseline to assess the changes in the soil when the dye contamination is introduced in fixed interval. With dye contamination at 10 GHz, the difference in reflectivity concerning pure soil is around 3 dB until 250 grams of dye and increased to more than 5 dB beyond. Better results were obtained at 9.58 GHz and 10.45 GHz. The difference in reflectivity levels is more than 15 dB at 9.58 GHz and more than 30 dB at 10.45 GHz. The plots are shown in figure slide 8. So based on the results obtained for frequencies at 9.58 GHz and 10.45 GHz, we can conclude that there is a significant difference observed in reflective values between when compared to the heterogeneous soil and, and soil with the pollutant. This could pay way for developing electronic system for pollution monitoring, which is non-invasive and non-destructive using microwave reflectometry. With further studies, a more enhanced detection system can be created, leading to the successful implementation of bioremediation process and contributing to the goal of achieving sustainable practices in the textile industry. These are the soil reflectivity plots obtained at various frequencies. At the 10 gigahertz, we can see there is a difference of 3 dB. And for the frequencies of 9.58 gigahertz and 10.45 gigahertz, there is a difference of 15 dB and 30 dB when compared to the heterogeneous soil levels. This proves that uh, the, method, the microwave reflectometry method suggested in this paper could be deployed for sustainable uh, uses and you can be used for soil pollutant so, so dye detection in the soil. See, uh, we chose X band frequency because uh, we thought X band frequency was more reliable, and then uh, the availability to test the uh, soil and the experimental setup uh, would be readily available for X band. So when we consider about the other frequency bands, it is a little difficult to, uh, you know, you know get the uh, uh, equipments and instruments for measuring at the other frequencies. Basically, X-band was chosen because it is one of the most common uh, uh, frequency range. And we also had references with where uh, previous researchers had also 
proceeded with X band, and hence we uh, decided for it. Uh, yeah, not it. In our college, so we performed it in that frequency range. So I guess uh, the VNA was from hundred so so it, it it was able it can go up to twenty eight gigahertz. So we chose X band because we started the project with some idea. We were working with X band and then uh, we okay we decided to extend it to the soil contamination detection in the X band frequency itself. A lower frequency will be preferable, but uh, procuring low frequency equipments and uh, is very hard. So. On uh, we use on and yeah on and. No, we don't. We did not consider the polarization. We just kept it at ninety degrees. Yeah, it was only. Uh... Yeah, so yeah, true. Like as I as I said, the reflection character. Uh, so we have to work. Or as I said, like the the experiment can be uh, carried out further. So we did not have any uh, specific time to carry out uh, further exp experiments. So we kept it at a simpler level, carrying out at ninety degrees. Yes, yes, other, yeah, like, as I said, like, the reflection will vary for a lot of, uh, it's a function of a lot of things, Various polarization, things. the soil, depth, uh, uh, everything, yeah, everything, yeah, yes, so, yeah, just a second, yeah, polarization comes in when we take uh, uh, incidents at different angles, here, since uh, we wanted to uh, eliminate so many factors influencing the reflection, we chose to, uh, you know, stay with the 90 degree reflection thing. Because there are various factors which will affect the reflection properties. Uh, so we want, we didn't want to complicate things even further by considering those things because uh, even uh, a little amount of moisture in the soil could have also contributed to uh, higher or lower reflectivity. So we chose to keep it at uh, a dry level. That is, we had dried out the soil completely before these tests. So, uh, you know, it... yeah. Yeah. So we, we tried to simplify everything. Else. Yeah. So we tried to keep down the, uh, you know, reduce the number of variables which will actually affect the test results. So that's why we hadn't taken polarization into consideration. That is oblique incidence. Yes. Yeah. At the top. Yes. It was carried out at normal room temperature. Uh, no, we haven't taken it. The idea we started with was for tunnel detection. So we did it as a final year project of us. So the extensive work was carried out in the last six months. The pro uh, so totally the we could say. Oh, you are asking about the temperature. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry. To be very specific, this ex particular part of the experiment was carried within three months. That is like June to August to September. But th since it was carried inside a laboratory, uh, we we didn't have to consider the external environment or temperature things. No, actually not higher, like, yeah. No, that's why we had uh, chosen to show that two frequencies which there were uh, which were there were 9.58 and 10.42 but in 10 at exact 10 gigahertz it was not the same like we didn't uh, like get much reflections yeah but uh, pictorial character, if there be any pictorial, uh, that we are talking about the 
Okay, ATL, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Haindavi, working as scientist engineer SD in National Remote Sensing Center, ISRO Department of Space. The topic is automated workflow for the generation of time composite mosaic of AVIPS Full India data. Coming to the introduction part, we used ResoSat 2 2A satellite AVIPS sensor data for this work. ResoSat 2 2A satellite is an immediate remote sensing satellite comprising of three sensors, LIS3, LIS4 and AVIPS. AVIPS sensor has four spectral bands, say green, red, near infrared and short wave infrared with 56 meters of spatial resolution. It has a revisit pe period of five days and since its revisiting capability is high, we are able to achieve six mosaics in a month using AVIPS sensor data out of which a single time composite mosaic is generated. Here are the specifications of AVIPS sensor data on the right side. Due to daily acquisition, the data is often affected by cloud and varying atmospheric conditions. Obtaining a cloud-free time composite mosaic with a sub-pixel image registration accuracy is really a challenging task, but this can be accomplished by applying cloud and sea masks on each input scene while GCP collection. After GCP collection, images are ortho-rectified using rational polynomial coefficients. These ortho or geometrically corrected data sets are used to generate a single image by a pixel based composite method called geomerian or geometric median. Coming to the methodology, AVIP sensor data is use, used is of geoortho kit on quadrant scene basis. The input data is supplied along with RPCs. Actually, RPCs are used to make the ortho product more precise. Now, top of atmospheric reflectance is calculated for each band of input data and stacked to obtain a multispectral data. Stacking is done using GDAL merge in Python. Now, cloud and C masks are applied on the input data before GCP collection itself in order to avoid these parts of the image while GCP collection. Now, GCPs are identified using Fourier transformed base image registration technique. RFM transformation model is used to transform the input image to match the reference. Using this RFM, the images are ortho rectified. Coming to the cloud mask and C mask generation, the cloud mask is generated using deep learning based model. The model is basically a convolutional neural network model which uses unit with attention module architecture. The C mask is generated from shapefile of India. Coming to the image registration and ortho rectification part. Image registration is the process of aligning images of the same scene taken by the same or different sensors at different times or different viewpoints. One of the most popular method to correct the further corrections on the image is Fourier transformed based correlation method. It is the image registration technique popularly used which obtains a sharp peak at the position of shift. The Susan method is used to find the corners in the image and forms the center of grid for matching with respect to reference. Ortho rectification is a process of removing image distortions caused due to sensor tilt and topographic relief and it ensures a constant scale throughout the image. Coming to time composite generation, geomedian is the method used for time composite generation and the entire process still here is automated. Geometric median is defined as the point minimizing the sum of distances to the input pixels for a given set of p-band pixel observations that is multi-band pixel time series the geometric median is defined as it is here where argmin means the value of the argument x which minimizes the sum 
here it is a point x from where the sum of all Euclidean distances to x i is minimum. The value computed out of geometric median is the synthetic value that is not a copy of any one of the actual input image pixels. This method has advantage of generating cloud-free mosaics even when up to half the input images contain clouds. Since the cloud cannot be limited up to 50%, we are using cloud masks to mask the input data. So coming to this slide, a WIPS sensor for every five days is able to produce 75 to 80 quadrant scenes covering the full India. Cloud-free data of Landsat 8 or 9, level 2 data mosaic of PAN 8 is used as reference and DEM of Aster with 30 meter posting is used. Here is the difference shown in the table how the RMS error is with mask and without mask. Examples on three quadrant scenes are shown. Coming to the results part, in top left figure, A is the multispectral quadrant scene of AWIPS data, B is the cloud mask obtained out of that data, and C is the input data upon which cloud pixels are masked, D is C mask overlaid on the input. Next, the bottom left figure shows the image registration quality with and without masks applied. On the right hand side, a to E are the time series data sets of different dates of Hyderabad area combined using geomedian method and F is the image obtained. Coming to the conclusion part, image on the right hand side is monthly full India composite mosaic of ABIPS data for the month of May 2023. Able to ensure subpixel accuracy with cloud and sea masks. If all pixels in the stack of mosaic are cloudy, then composite will be zero. This creates gaps in the mosaic, able to mask only thick clouds by our algorithm. Thin clouds alters the composite values and removal of these thin clouds is quite a challenging task and it is planned as future work. Thank you.